Hi, and welcome back. Um, we are, as part of the syllabus, working on 16th century art in Northern Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. But pretty much, I want to give you a, a brief background of, of um, Northern Europe. And uh, basically, towards the end of the 14th uh, century, that would be the, the 1300, uh, an agrarian society, the agrarian society all over Europe, agrarian means tied to the land, farming is really the basis of everything, starts moving, especially in Northern Europe, towards manufacturing and trade, okay? Yes, you do have farming, you still have farming, we need farming, no farming, no life. But you know, we have, um, we have people that are starting to manufacture goods and they don't farm, they just manufacture, they do goods by hand and then they trade them for food. And also you have um, trade and then the people that take those goods and trade them both locally in Northern Europe and maybe taking them as far south as Italy. You know, again, Europe is a very contained, it's a it's small area. Well, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean, so I'm from a teeny area, I'm from an island. But you know, relatively small, it's not the United States size or China, you know, um, and or, or Brazil for that matter. In any case, so you have an emergent uh, trade and manufacturing sector happening and you have with this trade and manufacturing center the beginning of cities clusters of people that are not necessarily farming but that produce goods okay that sell those goods that trade those goods okay and so we have the beginning of the middle class why is it the middle because it's not the kings right there's kings all over the place and they aren't the farmers they are in the middle okay that's the emergent middle class and that middle class again mostly trades they do trading or they do manufacturing okay and this is the beginning of the small cities like Paris. well the small cities big cities but the cities like paris london bruges prague barcelona basel okay and this is also the beginning of trades or of of, of uh, careers or professions such as banking so there's a need to like have banks where you bring a letter of credit, you get money, and you also have lawyers, you know, people to do contracts because I'm going to send you 10 pairs of shoes and you're going to give me 200 heads of lettuce or who knows what the deals were. Um, in any case, um, basically, this group, this middle class, these new endeavors are encouraging innovation, technology, things like that, okay? And one of the amazing things that starts uh, coming through is the printing press. Like uh, that had been in China from before. The printing in China emerges earlier, earlier due to Buddhist sutras, you know, to print Buddhist sutras. But eventually we get a guy called Gutenberg in Germany who does movable print type. And we have the printing press. And, um, and anyway, and we're starting to see a little bit of the beginning of the global economy of today, the one that just stopped because of the coronavirus, right? So, so we have these this things going on. And, um, and again, we're talking about Northern Europe. We're gonna talk about the Netherlands. I wanna talk about art in this context, right at the time of the Renaissance. And what's going on super important? Well, the thing that you must remember, you know, 14th, 15th century, you know, is that first of all, the Catholic Church is no longer the one church. We had, you know, uh, Martin Luther, we have a split with the Catholic Church, you know, and, uh, and we have also, um, actually before Martin Luther, there was a split within the Catholic Church and two popes, one in Italy, one in Avignon in France. So there was a split even as early as the 1300. Later, the split became very serious with the Protestants and the, German, and the Germans. And, um, and there's also printed matter. So 1300s, the church is having its own internal difficulty and we have the beginning of printed matter. And you know, you can print documents in your language, okay? So let's talk about this Northern Europe. I wanna start with the Netherlands, the Netherlands. What are the Netherlands? Well, these are rich lands. These are the lands of, com of commerce, of banking. And you have the North Netherlands, that is Holland, we know as Holland, and the South Netherlands, which is known as Belgium, 
okay? And Belgium, and these are very important places for art in our history, okay? Um, so uh, these, uh, these places, these places, because they're home to bureaucrats, there's a, a big amount of bureaucrats, meaning people that, 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 have, that do paper, push paper, people that, that trade, okay, people that produce goods. You have uh, a middle class, and because they're also, some of them are Protestant, they, they, they're not so big on the religious paintings. So, they invest in oils. You have a middle class that says, oh, I want a little painting for my living room. Oh, I want a little painting for my room. And they're not necessarily paintings of virgins or saints. So this is the emergence of a new type of art, a new type of painting, and it comes from the Netherlands, and it's usually oil paint, okay? Because the big frescoes are for the big churches, the little panel paintings were also religious icons. So there's a new medium, the oil painting, for this emergence in the 1400s, late 1300s, 1400s. It really emerged in 1400s, oil paint. So, you know, um, basically we have uh, an exquisite amount of oil painting coming out of the Netherlands. And we have masters like Klaus Sluter, Okay, um, we also have, we do have religious paintings too. There's, there's also religious paintings. And, and they also specialized a lot in manuscripts, in little manuscripts with art, you know, like things that have to do with the religion and little religious paintings. Those are all going on at, at this time. And, you know, some cities, some cities in the Netherlands, and some artists in the Netherlands are some of the most famous artists that we know even today. Um, so, so let's talk about some of them. Let's talk about some of them. Uh, by the way, before we talk about them, please know that also there are guilds because there are centers of professions. Professions join together, professionals, and they make up a guild. Think about the unions today, the work unions today. So painters got together and they created a guild. So they were kind of unionized. Now, one of the most important painters of the time is Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck. And we sometimes uh, attribute, a lot of people attribute to him, that invention of oil paint. So Jan van Eyck, he invented oil paint, okay? And he does amazing, very detailed paintings with a lot of naturalism. You get all these details uh, with a lot of these Netherlandish painters. There is a Ghent altarpiece. There's a Ghent altarpiece. There's also the man with the red turban. What a piece. That's from 1433. It's an oil on panel. Oil, but on wood, not on canvas. <clears throat> and it's a self-portrait. It's a self-portrait of Van Eyck, okay? Incredible, incredible. Then we also have the Arnolfini portrait, the portrait of this probably well-to-do couple. You can see their house, the luxury in which they live, especially at this time, okay? Um, so there's also Roger van der Weyden, Roger van der Weyden, another important master from the Netherlands area, okay? Uh, there's a descent from the cross by van der Weyden that's very important, very influential. But you know, as everything is, we have to keep on going. There's just so many artists and so little time. So, you know, we have uh, that a lot of these artists are using some of the new techniques from, from Italy. There is perspective being brandished, there is sfumato, there is chiaroscuro, all these things, you know, are, are coming through. And of course, atmospheric perspective is also big, you know. And just so you know, atmospheric perspective, I don't know if I described it accurately before, color becomes less intense with the distance. That is atmospheric perspective. The, the things that are in front have brighter color. The things that are in the distance are diffuse colors. That's how you create the sensation, the fiction of distance through atmospheric perspective. So um, when we talk about the Northern Netherlands, I was mostly talking about the Southern Netherlands. When we talk about the Northern Netherlands, we have a master like Hieronymus Bosch. And Bosch did this tortured world of little creatures and, uh, and amazing masterpieces, which were collected assiduously by the Spanish. 
because the Spanish were very involved in the Netherlands. They took over part of the Netherlands and the Netherlands fought and fought the Spanish. So there is this sort of mixture of Spanish and Netherlands um, because the, the Spain took over part of the Netherlands. So, um, so yeah, one of the most incredible areas of development in art in the Netherlands is also printmaking. They would make copies of paintings to sell multiple copies. And the woodcuts in particularly, uh, wood engravings, are particularly remarkable. And of course, one of the greatest of the, of the, of the visual artists, both a painter, but for woodcuts especially, is Albrecht Dürer. When I showed you at the beginning the different print mediums, I showed you Albrecht Dürer. So um, that kind of gives you a sense of what's going on in the Netherlands at this early stage. But then why don't we continue, since I have your attention, why don't we continue to the 16th century, the, uh, the 1600s or the 17th century. Let's keep going with the Netherlands to the 17th century, okay? And there we have the Habsburgs, okay? The Spanish Catholic monarchs, you know, are, are on top of the Netherlands. They're trying to keep the Netherlands from being Protestant because because they're Northern Europe, they really followed up, um, you know, Martin Luther and they became Protestant. So there's a whole, whole difference between the Northern Netherlands, which are the Dutch and they're tolerant and they're traders and they don't, they're not Catholic, they're Protestant and they're all about business. These are the people that took over New York. These are the people that traded $26 and a bunch of beads for the island of Manhattan, you know? Uh, these are the Dutch. And on the south, you know, and on the south, you have the Catholics, okay? You have the Catholics. So in the north, you have Holland, um, and you have various schools, Amsterdam, Haarlem, Utrecht, Leiden, and Delft, okay? Also, at this point, we've moved on, right? We started more in the 1500s. Now, I'm all the way in the 1600s. Now you have the birth of the great corporations. Painting becomes the way of depicting the board of directors of the corporations. It's not really just painting. We have paintings about things, luxury items, paintings about landscapes, paintings like all kinds of genre paintings. And in the midst of all this, we have corporate paintings. Oh, you have a company. And the biggest company at this point, or one of the biggest companies, is the Dutch East India Company, a company that sent ships that invested, people came together, everybody put five dollars, till you have five thousand dollars, and then they sent their ships uh, to the east. They sent their ships, they, they the tea, you know, from Ceylon, you know, that kind of thing. So you have a lot of paintings that have to do with board members. And basically, um, that's the north. Then in the south, you have the Catholics, you have a place like Flanders, you know, and you have the greatest painter, perhaps Netherlandish painter of the era, a guy called Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens. And basically, by now, when we're talking about the 1600s, we're talking about the Baroque. Barroco is a Portuguese word for a pearl with a defect. When you have a pearl, you know, pearls are perfect, round, very shiny, smooth. And if it has a defect, you can see it, but it's still a perfect object with a little defect. So that's the word barroco. That's what comes after mannerism. And in uh, the Southern Netherlands, you know, we have this amazing painter in Flanders, you know, uh, uh, called Peter Paul Rubens. And he's a virtuoso. He was received all over Europe. And he used to paint this heavy set ladies, these heavyset women. So if somebody tells you, oh, you're a Rubenesque beauty, he's calling you chubby, all right? So that's become like synonymous with him. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures, racing of the cross, you know, some women by Rubens, some flower paintings, um, the garden of love, he, his wife died, so he married a really young woman and he went head over heels. Uh, at the end of his life. And again, Rubens was like Titian.
He was working for the most powerful monarchs in Europe, so he was making a lot of money. He had a lot of attendance. Every painting is as big as this or bigger. It's like Hollywood. Remember, there's no Hollywood or Bollywood for that matter. So this is Bollywood, right? This, the paintings are the entertainment. Oh, look at that figure. Oh, look at that angel. Oh my God, she's kind of, uh, she's kind of Rubenesque, that woman, you know. So it became a, a topic of conversation in a palace, a topic of conversation in the boardroom of the big Dutch East India Company and other such uh, merchant homes uh, in, in, in Holland. So um, we shall have to talk about, um, we shall have to write or, or at least uh, remember some of his images for the quizzes and the test. But you know, we are going to let go at this. We kind of, we kind of cheated in this lesson because we talked about uh, the Renaissance in Northern Europe and then also the Baroque, okay, in Northern Europe. But now we are going to go to other countries in Europe so our next lesson will be about the Baroque in France, the Baroque in, in other places in Europe. Thank you.